Well, this morning, let's um, begin by reading the text. Um, I was thrown off a little bit last week because I, I didn't... Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the text on my computer all the time and not seeing the divisions that are, that are in uh, the printed version that I have of the Bible. So I didn't notice that part of verse 36 was actually in the next paragraph, which made me... Uh, well, kind of threw me off a little bit as I was reading it. But seeing that it is at the beginning of this paragraph, I thought it might not be a bad idea to... Uh, to read that snippet. Don't worry, we'll just pick it up on verse 37 on the screen. But this is what we read. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted. And I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Now, the last two verses are, are the text we're going to look at this evening, but I believe uh, I, well, that I told them I wanted to read these as well. We need to see that this unbelief was not global, it wasn't universal. Notice what's said here. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, that is... An entirely different subject, so we're going to take that one up this evening. But what I want us to see this morning is basically this, that the Jews had all this before them, but yet they didn't believe. And they didn't believe because they couldn't believe. And the reason why they couldn't believe was because God blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Now, I think that much is clear in the text, but what we need to understand is what it all means. I mean, the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last week we saw Jesus struggling within himself because his hour had come. The hour when he would lay down his life, when he would go to the cross and face not just the crucifixion. Uh, there were many people who were crucified and experienced what Jesus experienced. But what he was really struggling with was the fact that he was going to have to endure his father's wrath on the cross, his full wrath. But we also saw the fact that he knew that this is why the Father sent him into the world in the first place. This is why he came. And that this would save us from God's judgment. Kept him moving forward. You see, he focused not on himself and his own comfort levels, but rather on what his sacrifice meant. Now this sacrifice, we were told further last week, would change the world. And that kept him also focusing on the cross. But because by his death, Satan's dominion over the world would be broken. And the door of salvation would be opened to all men. Salvation was only in Israel for a while. But after Jesus came, of course, people didn't have to come to Israel any longer. Now the gospel goes out to them because the world has been freed from the tyranny of the evil one, although not absolutely. I mean, Satan is still at work, as we saw. Uh, he has, as some have said, a very long chain. He's always been on a chain of some kind. I mean, God is the one who's in control of him. He's not outside of God's control. But whereas Satan could keep the world in darkness before, now he cannot do that. Now, we also saw that as Jesus was speaking about his death, the Jews did not understand him that Messiah had to die. Remember, they thought that the Messiah had come to overthrow the Romans and that he was going to sit on the throne of David and from that time forever he was going to reign over the entire earth. Well, Jesus has already explained to his disciples that it wasn't the case, but rather than explain it to them, what he was really about to do, that in his death and resurrection he would ascend the throne, but it wasn't the throne of David. It was the throne of God in heaven to rule over all the nations from heaven, instead of explaining that to them, he told them instead that they should use the time that he is with them to believe while the light is there. 
Now this morning we see their response to what Jesus said, that they should believe. Jesus tells us, or actually John tells us, that they didn't believe. We have to say at least many of them didn't believe. And the reason, as we saw, why they didn't believe was that they couldn't believe. That's what John tells us. So first of all, we see that these Jews did not believe in Jesus. John writes in verse 37, But though he had performed... So, though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. Now the first thing I want us to notice about this passage is that their unbelief was not due to a lack of evidence. Jesus had performed, John tells us, many signs. Now we've already seen in John's gospel that John records just a few of them. You know, I think it's like seven of them in order to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. He was very selective. But he also clearly tells us that Jesus performed many, many more than these. He writes toward the end of his gospel in verses um, 30 and 31 in chapter 20. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, John may not have recorded these things. He does tell us they did happen, and we've seen allusions to that through his gospel, but if you want to see what those other miracles were, read the other gospels because many of those miracles are recorded. Not all of them, but many of them. Now, Jesus not only did these miracles, but John tells us that these Jews actually saw them with their own eyes. In verse 37, he says, he had performed so many signs before them. That is, before these Jews who weren't believing. Now, this is the Passover, remember. And there were many Jews at this feast who were from all different parts of the Roman Empire who, we might think, didn't really see what he had done, and maybe some of them didn't. But it's also likely that many of these Jews actually had seen Jesus and his miracles because, remember, this is the last Passover. Jesus celebrated at least two before it. Some think maybe three because his ministry went on for three and a half uh, years. But he had been to all the mandatory feasts. Likely he was also there at all the other feasts that were not required. And every time he was there, he used the opportunities that these feasts presented to preach the gospel and to show how they pointed to him. And of course, through ministering the gospel, he also ministered miracles. He did miracles to prove that what he was saying was from God. So many of these Jews, as they, remember, all male Jews, wherever they were in the Roman Empire, had to come to Jerusalem three times a year to these feasts. They would have intersected with Jesus on numerous occasions before this. Now, John could also be referring to the particular miracles Jesus did at Jerusalem. Remember, he healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He also uh, gave sight to the man who was born blind, uh, put the mud in his eyes and sent him to Siloam. He had also raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, that didn't happen in Jerusalem, but it happened in Bethany, which was only two miles away. And it was because of that miracle that Jesus had that huge host of Jews that were uh, praising and worshiping as he entered into Jerusalem singing Hosanna, save us now, Messiah, son of David. Those Jews were there because they had either seen that miracle or had talked to somebody who had gathered a rather large crowd all at once. But even though he had done so many miracles and they had seen them, they still didn't believe. They still didn't receive Jesus as their Messiah. Now, you know, it's a common saying throughout many years now that seeing is believing but we need to ask ourselves the question is that always true is that always going to be true well not necessarily because these Jews saw and yet they didn't believe remember what Jesus said on another occasion to Thomas blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe it's possible to believe without seeing some people won't believe unless they do see but some people can see and still not believe now we know that miracles are powerful. We know that miracles are designed to stop traffic, to do something 
that is beyond what we normally see so that those who see them would know that the one who is speaking is actually speaking God's word. They do stop traffic. But they don't necessarily convince. They certainly don't convert. If that were the case, these Jews would all be converted. The Lord may use them uh, to the end of converting individuals, but by themselves they are not enough. And as a matter of fact, sometimes miracles can actually have the opposite effect. When the Pharisees saw Jesus cast a demon out of a blind man, or actually a man who was blind and mute, they accused him of being in league with the devil. A miracle, therefore you're the Messiah. No, a miracle, therefore you're in league with Satan. Those who had seen the miracle that Jesus performed of healing the lame man on the Sabbath accused him of breaking the Sabbath and said he should die because he broke the Sabbath instead of looking at the fact that he healed a lame man who had been there for like 40 years or so. So the point is, miracles don't necessarily convert. Sometimes they can even be used as arguments against the messenger, against the truth the person is actually preaching. <clears throat> but here we see the problem is not with the evidence because that's what miracles are meant to do. There was plenty of evidence that, that Jesus had given them through his miracles that all pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. They should have believed, but they didn't believe. He did the things that God said in the Old Testament Messiah would do when he came. Well, the problem wasn't with the evidence, so maybe the problem was with the message. Maybe they didn't believe because Jesus wasn't saying the right things. Well, we know that can't be the case because Jesus is perfect in every way. His message was perfect. What he was preaching was exactly what Isaiah the prophet said. The Messiah would preach when he came into the world, bringing the good news of salvation to those who were afflicted, proclaiming liberty to those who were captives to sin. That's exactly what Jesus did. He was preaching the gospel. Now, that wasn't the problem. Well, maybe the problem was the messenger. It was and it wasn't. Now, we know that there was no problem with Jesus' communication, right? Uh, nobody could preach like Jesus could preach. He was the perfect orator, the perfect teacher. He was better than Spurgeon, believe it or not. Better than Whitfield. Sometimes we don't think of Jesus in those terms, but he, he was the best. He was perfect in every way. So they had far more than enough evidence. They were hearing the truth, the message Messiah was supposed to bring, and they heard it from a messenger who was absolutely perfect in his delivery and in his life, which supported that message. But they still didn't believe. Now, I emphasize that because, again, we want this to be applicable to us in, at different levels, and I think it can be helpful for us to understand uh, today that most people who reject the gospel usually reject it on one of these three grounds. Most of the time, they blame the evidence, don't they? Now, we don't have miracles to show them that we can perform, but we can point to the miracles that are in the Bible. But what good is that if they don't believe that the Bible is true? And many people don't. They think that there's no evidence that this, this word, this, this book, was actually written by uh, the one we believe it was written by, that it's the Word of God. They don't believe there's any evidence that God exists. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Science has proven as far as they're concerned. That not only evolution, not only can evolution explain everything, but it does in fact explain everything. It came about through some cosmic accident. Now this is what they have chosen to believe regarding the evidence. But the question we need to ask is, are they justified in that belief? Will God accept that argument on the day of judgment? Is there no evidence that the Bible is true? Well, if they'd only take the time to pick it up and read it, I think the Lord would quickly show them at least at some level, that it is his word. I mean, they may not accept it, they may not necessarily say they believe it, but I think God will show it to them. Is there no evidence that God exists? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 1 that there's far more than enough evidence in nature not only to prove that God exists, but actually to leave them without excuse for not believing and worshiping him. Now, I believe that that includes everyone in the world. As a matter of fact, even people who can't see and can't hear. Uh, 
I don't know if you uh, knew this, but Helen Keller, who was born deaf and blind, knew that God existed, even though she had never seen and never heard. She still knew it. She knew it because she had enough evidence, even from what she could gather from her senses. Everybody has enough evidence. Everybody sees the evidence. Everybody knows that God exists. That's what Paul says in Romans 1, verse 20. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, and he's talking about everyone in the world, are without excuse. Yes, there's plenty of evidence that God exists, and everybody knows he exists. That's what Paul says. And that's God's word, and what he says is true. Is there really any evidence at all that evolution is true? And here's the one thing that's, that's really amazing, that people believe that, and yet everything about it proves that it isn't true. Everything that they see, everything that they study, as a matter of fact, many evolutionists are actually leaving the evolutionary position because they find it to be indefensible. There isn't any evidence that what we see, all the design we see, even on a cosmic level, but particularly as we look in the cells and the design of the human body, that all of this could have happened by accident, that time and matter and chance could explain it all. That doesn't really explain anything. Only one who is infinitely wise, infinitely powerful, infinitely intelligent can explain what it is we see. The more we examine the creation, the more impossible we see that evolution could possibly be true. Well, that's all to say there's no problem with the evidence. There's more than enough to prove that Christianity is true. There's more than enough actually to, to leave everyone without excuse on the day of judgment. Well, if the problem isn't with the evidence, maybe the problem is with the messengers of the gospel. I mean, Jesus isn't here to preach anymore. Uh, and it, the job is really left up to us to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are others justified in rejecting Christianity on the grounds of a defect in the messengers? You know, the, people look at the church today, and I think we'd have to admit, and maybe agree with them, that there is a lot of hypocrisy in the church. I'm not, you know, pointing fingers, naming names, or anything like that, because we all have a degree of it in ourselves. All of us are, but. Perhaps some have more glaring difficulties than others. And as they look at the church, they see so few Christians, if any, taking seriously what they believe, seriously enough to prove that even they believe it. So when they come to them and try to convince them, it's not very convincing. And really, when you look around, how often do you run into a Christian who's actually witnessing to somebody? It doesn't happen very often, and how often are we witnessing to others that we really show that we believe it by communicating it to others, other individuals. Well, you see, they might have an argument here because this is a weakness in the church. Hypocrisy and unbelief is the main reason why the kingdom of heaven isn't advancing more than it is, more quickly than it is. That's really the whole point of the booklet that we've been reading on revival, that, that it does depend on us to some degree to live the life God calls us to live and to get that gospel out if we're going to see the kingdom of heaven advance. But on the other hand, let's not forget that everybody out there already doesn't have an excuse even if they never heard the message. And even if we could be perfect messengers, which we can't be, we can't, okay? They would still reject the message. I mean, look at these Jews. They were listening to Jesus. They saw miracles and they still rejected the gospel, they rejected him. But let's make sure that we do the very best we can. We don't want to excuse ourselves because of that. We want our lives to be a reason why people receive Christ and not a reason why they may not want to receive Christ. Well, what about the message? Can the people in the world today reject Christianity on the grounds of the message? Well, certainly they can they do. What about the way we communicate that message? Well, we may not be doing the best job of communicating it to others, but the Lord can use whatever truth we're able to communicate to convert people because it's not, it's not us. It is the message by the power of the Holy Spirit. But again, I want to remind you that even if we were able to share it perfectly, there's no guarantee that they would believe. 
the Jews that Jesus was ministering to had powerful evidence. They saw miracles. It was brought, the message, by a powerful orator, the greatest preacher who ever lived. And he delivered the message perfectly, said exactly what needed to be said in the way it needed to be said, and still they didn't believe. Now we have to ask ourselves this question. If they had all of that and they still didn't receive Jesus, they still weren't converted, they still weren't saved, what chance do we have of converting anyone or convincing anyone? Well, you know what? The, the possibility that we will be successful is actually as great or greater, I would say probably greater, than it was with Jesus himself. Now that, that sounds strange and we do need to understand uh, why that is the case. It's not because we're better than Jesus, not because we can communicate better than Jesus, not because we can do miracles, but it's because of the situation that Jesus was ministering in, which is what we want to look at next. So we've seen that they didn't believe. Let's go on now to consider why they didn't believe. Well, the answer to that question I've already given you is because they couldn't believe. Now, John goes on to tell us that what was happening is what the Spirit, through the Scriptures, through the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah in particular, said would happen many years before it actually took place. Uh, John has told us in verse 41 that the verses we're going to look at next, verses 38 through 40, were written specifically about Jesus. Verse 41 says this, These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Now, was Isaiah, is this talking about Isaiah 6 when he was lifted up into the heavenly chambers and he saw things that no man has, had seen or could see and said, woe is me, and so forth, possibly? Or was it because God had revealed to Isaiah what he was writing about when, where he quotes what's going to be quoted next, the section of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53? Isaiah was writing about things that he saw, but he knew that what he was writing about was the Messiah. Now in verse 38, we read regarding the fact that these Jews didn't believe this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the, Lord of, uh, the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now again, I've already pointed out to you that these are the opening words from Isaiah 53, the chapter about the suffering servant, all about Jesus Christ. Jesus was going to be rejected. Jesus was going to suffer. Jesus was going to die. That's what we read about in Isaiah 53. And he was going to at the hands of those he came to save. And the reason would be because they didn't believe. Lord, who has believed our reports? The implication is, well, either no one or not many. Now, why didn't they believe? Well, obviously, it's because, or maybe it's not so obvious, but we need to understand. It was because, first of all, this was a part of God's plan to bring about the crucifixion of his son that he might bear our sins on the cross, that we might be forgiven. You ever thought about what would have happened if Jesus had come down and everybody warmly received him and they, they made him king and he never actually went to the cross? Wouldn't be any salvation, would there? Well, how is it that Jesus then was going to be crucified? How could God guarantee that when he sent Jesus down into the world that he would be crucified? That is a very important question because Jesus had to die. Now, some surmise that if the Jews didn't and they made him king, that the Romans would come in and they would crucify him anyway. But that's not what the scripture tells us in the Old Testament. It tells us that his own people were going to reject him and crucify him. And we need to take that into account. Now, again, God had to make sure that this would take place when he sent Jesus into the world. This was a part of his plan. Jesus must die so that he could atone for our sins. Now the disciples understood this and they said as much when they prayed in Acts chapter 4 verses 27 through 28 where they tell us plainly this was God's plan that they not believe and reject him. They said for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Israel. 
to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. This was God's plan. He predestined this to, to occur. They were opposed to Jesus. And the reason being was because God was intending through the greatest crime in history, the crucifixion not only of an innocent man, but one who was infinitely holy, infinitely worthy, that through that crime he would bring about the salvation of all his people from every nation under heaven, a multitude which no man can number. This was the Lord's plan. But how did the Lord bring this about? How could the Lord ensure that the Jews would, would not believe, would hand Jesus over to be crucified so that he could die and would die for our sins according to God's plan? Well, John tells us in verses 39 and 40, and this is where we get to the difficult part. For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. They couldn't believe because the Lord blinded their eyes. They couldn't believe because God hardened their hearts. He did that so they wouldn't see. He did that so they wouldn't understand. He did that so they wouldn't be converted, which means turn from their sins to Christ. He did that so they wouldn't be healed, at least not at that time. Because we do know many, perhaps even of these Jews, that rejected Jesus may later, excuse me, have received him. After he had been crucified, though, after he had been buried, after he had been raised, after he had been glorified and poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now this is how the Lord ensured that they would reject Jesus Christ, betray Jesus Christ, that he would be crucified. But we need to ask the question again, how did God do this? Well, we know he didn't physically blind them because they saw the miracles Jesus did. And it's not talking about physical blindness. He didn't take away their understanding entirely like he did with King Nebuchadnezzar when he lived like a beast, as it were, for seven seasons and then the Lord restored his reason to him. These Jews knew Jesus had done these miracles and they knew what the Old Testament said. They knew the message. They knew the messenger. They actually knew that was the Messiah. That's pretty serious to reject him when you know all these things. But the Lord, you know, didn't blind, didn't do this physically, take away their reason, but he did do something that prevented them from repenting, that kept them from turning from their rebellion and trusting in Jesus. So the question now is, how could God do that and still be just? How could he hold them accountable for something that he made them do, that he caused them to do? Because he was the one who blinded. He was the one who uh, hardened their hearts. Well, we need to make sure that we do not understand that God doing this in any way that sees God as in any way creating evil or putting evil in their hearts or making them do something they didn't already want to do. You see, if that was true, then God would be the author of sin and God would be responsible for their sins. But we know that cannot be the case. The Lord tells us, actually Habakkuk tells us, Habakkuk, in chapter 1, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Uh, to force somebody to sin would be an evil thing. God can't even look at wickedness because he is absolutely pure and holy. There is no variation or shifting shadow in God. James writes in James chapter 1 verses 13 through 14, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Did God tempt these men to sin? Did God ensure that these men were going to sin? Did he force them to sin? I should say, did he ensure it through a forcing? Did he make them? Did he even tempt them? James tells us no. That can't be the case. So how can both of these things be true? How can, how can um, God make it impossible for these Jews to believe? 
by blinding their eyes and hardening their hearts and yet at the same time not be responsible for their sin of rejecting his son. Well, the answer is that God simply used the evil that was already present in their hearts to blind and to harden them. In the same way he did Pharaoh, remember. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He told Moses before he went to Pharaoh, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart and he will not let the people go. I'm going to do that, God said. But how can God do that and not be responsible for Pharaoh's not letting the people go? And remember, God didn't want Pharaoh to let the people go at one level because God had intended to destroy Egypt with all those plagues and to show his power as he delivers his people out of Egypt. So how could God make it so that Pharaoh wouldn't let them go so he could bring these judgments and not be responsible for Pharaoh's sin? Well, again, in the same way, he simply used the sin that was already in Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was already a wicked man. Pharaoh already didn't want to let the people go. And when he saw Moses standing before him saying, God says to you, let my people go, well, that's all that was necessary to make Pharaoh's heart even harder as God removes his restraint and exposes him to things that are going to antagonize his sin. Now, what Moses did was not wrong. Pharaoh's response was entirely wrong and Pharaoh was entirely responsible for it. So here... The Lord, in blinding their eyes and hardening their hearts, simply chose to withdraw the restraint that he had already put on their hearts by his Holy Spirit, remembering again what it is they were really like to begin with. I mean, he's not restraining good in them. He doesn't have to restrain good in them because there was no good in them. There was only sin. There was only evil. That's what Paul tells us is in man's heart. Nothing good, but only evil. As we read in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, which you've read, I'm sure, on numerous occasions. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Who was Paul referring to here? He was referring to the human race. He was referring to mankind. Just look at the history of the world, and you'll see that what he says is true. That is what happens among mankind. So left unchecked, left without restraint, people like this would destroy themselves. They would destroy everyone around them. They would destroy the world. But God doesn't want that to happen. God wants to preserve the world so that he can gather his people out of the world so that he can save a multitude which no man can number, but he can't save them if he lets these people run amok. So he restrains this sin as he even converts many of these people now, since God does not owe this restraint to anyone, he is free to strengthen it, to make somebody more upright, you know, better, a better citizen. Or he can weaken it and make them less better citizens as he chooses. Now, here he chose to withdraw it so that these Jews would absolutely not receive the Lord Jesus Christ, so that they would turn him over to the Romans, so that he would be crucified, so that he would die for our sins. And since, of course, he is the only one who, can, who uh, gives this restraint and takes it away, he is the one who acts positively in this matter and can be said to blind and he can be said to harden and yet still not be responsible for the sin because this is something they did because they wanted to, because of their own sins, because in the wickedness of their own hearts, this is what they wanted to do. As a matter of fact, they might have just jumped on Jesus and tried to tear him apart if God had not restrained it entirely. Uh, really, when you stop and think about it, the description that the Lord gives us of mankind and what, we like, what we're like when we come into the world could very easily be applied to Satan himself. Unconverted man has the same nature, an aversion to God and a love for what is evil. And that's exactly what Satan has, only perhaps with greater strength. But ours is restrained as we come into the world. 
Now, God has every reason not to give this restraint to anyone, but he even had a greater reason to remove it from these Jews because they already wanted to kill his son, as we read on numerous occasions. It was an act of judgment against them. Just read the parables. You know the parables, the reason why Jesus spoke in parables in Matthew 13? They, the, the disciples asked Jesus that question. We often think it's because Jesus was such a great teacher and he illustrated everything so wonderfully and we can see all these truths when he paints the pictures in nature and so forth. But they heard the parables and they didn't even understand what he was saying. And we wouldn't either unless Jesus had explained them to us. Well, the disciples asked him that question. Why are you doing this? He says, because to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom and not to them. It hasn't been granted to them. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, these parables are actually an act of judgment against them so that seeing they wouldn't see and that hearing they wouldn't hear or turn from their sins and be converted. It was an act of judgment against them. You see, that is why they wouldn't believe. That's why God hardened. And that's also why when we share the gospel, we should expect perhaps a greater, a greater result, a better result than Jesus did because he was ministering to a group of people that were under God's judgment. Now, some of the people, you know, this nation is becoming increasingly like that, but I think Israel had kind of hit the, hit the peak there because you know what happened in 70 A.D. So we should expect better results than what Jesus saw because we're using the same gospel, we have the same evidence, we have the same message, and we have all this other evidence the Lord has shown us. God will bring whom he will. So this was an act of judgment against them, but remember, at the same time, it was an act of mercy to us. Through that act, God saved us through the death of Christ. Now, just a couple of applications. What was true of these Jews, I think you've already heard me saying, was also true of us when we came into the world. Okay? We didn't arrive into this world trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. We weren't born with a remnant of goodness in us, just enough to receive Jesus when he was offered to us. We came into the world dead to absolutely everything that was good and alive to everything evil, as Paul already told us in Romans chapter 3. We came into the world enemies of God. We actually hated God. We may not have thought we did. We may not have felt that we did. But we didn't even know who he was, for one thing. And once we learned about him, maybe we didn't respond like these Jews did, but that's because God was restraining our sin. Okay? The only reason we were not worse than we were, and I think we'd all look back at our childhood and early years and say, hey, you know, did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. The only reason why we weren't worse than we were was because of God's restraining grace. And the only reason we ever believed was because of his intervention in our lives, as we read this morning. If this is the, if the situation with mankind, if there's no one who does good, none who seeks after God, no one absolutely no one, then how does anyone ever come to Christ? Well, remember what our meditation said, what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, notice it's not because of the great love with which we loved him, it's not because we were so smart or so handsome or so beautiful or so witty, but it was only God, it was God because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And remember what grace means. Grace is something you didn't do, but it's something he did. It's purely a gift. He does it all. By grace you have been saved. Paul wants to remind us it wasn't because of our works, not even reaching out and receiving Christ. It was purely by His grace, the whole thing, from beginning to end. We owe God all the credit for our salvation. We would have perished forever without Him. He did it all. So as we think about that, let's be reminded what we owe Him, how much we should love Him, how much we should serve Him as He deserves with everything that we have to serve him with, with, with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our time, all of our resources, all of our opportunities, with every thought, with every word, with every action. That is the only thing that, that can answer to what the Lord has done. 
And then secondly, let me just mention, for those of you here this morning who may never have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, let me just leave you a couple of things to consider. The first one is, you would be a lot worse than you are uh, if it were not for God and His mercy in restraining your sin. You need to be thankful for that restraint. And by the way, we should be mindful of that too as we go out to evangelize that sometimes we're talking to people that are pretty good, outwardly good people, good neighbors. Maybe they outstrip us in every way, showing kindness and love uh, because it makes them feel good to do it or whatever reason they do. But, you know, people that would outstrip us by a mile, why are they doing that? And the question might come into our minds, do they really need to be saved? Well, the Lord says their works aren't good enough. The Lord says everyone is in that condition we just read about. Their sin is being restrained. They still need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be deceived. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, don't be deceived by the fact that you think you're, you're good and that God's going to accept you as you are because what you're experiencing is his restraint. God is doing that. You're not doing that. He's not going to reward you for that. You still need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't, secondly, confuse that restraint for saving grace. If you don't love him, if you're not trusting him alone for your salvation, if you're not following Jesus Christ with your whole life, if you're not giving it all to him, you still need God's mercy and his grace. And as we've just been reminded throughout this entire service, he is the only one who can give you what you need. He's the only one who can change your heart. He's the only one who can open your eyes. He's the only one who can unstop your ears. He's the only one who can bring you savingly to himself. And so if that is all concerning, at all concerning to you, you need to look to him for his mercy. You need to ask him for his grace. You've already heard the gospel. Jesus says, believe, repent and believe. Believe on me. That's all you need to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the gospel. That's all that's, you really need to know. You know that. But the ability to do that comes from God. You need to ask him for that grace. And if you do, you know, wait and see what the Lord will do because the Lord tells us he is merciful and compassionate and he is able to save to the uttermost everyone who will come to him. So may the Lord take all these things we've seen, we've seen quite a bit this morning, Let's, may he take all these things and apply them uh, to our lives as we need to hear them this morning. Let's bow for just a moment and let's just silently ask the Lord to apply what we've heard uh, to ourselves this morning. And uh, let's, let's also ask the Lord to prepare us uh, to come to his table.